Thanks for joining us. Uh, really excited for this conversation. We got an impressive group of city and municipal leaders around the table. Um, before we introduce our panel, just a few logistics, just to let everyone know that Scottsdale City Cable 11 is recording this, so um, be on your best behavior. And then um, everyone in the audience, if you could silence your phones. I'm sorry you have to see the back of my bald head, but um, we're, let's go around the room for a quick intro of everyone, just real quick, and then we'll uh, get started on the questions. Mayor Gallego. Good morning, Mayor Kate Gallego, Phoenix's very new mayor, so I will celebrate six months later this week. Uh, previously worked for about a decade at the Salt River Project. I hold an environmental degree and an MBA. Mayor Lord. Good morning, I'm Georgia Lord, the mayor of Goodyear, and you did not give me any mornings like that, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make that clear before we get going here. Anyway, this is great to be with this group, very comfortable. Uh, in fact, I think this is the first time with you, Kate, I'm looking forward to it, except Mag. Um, and so this is very nice. Thank you for the invite. Certainly. Yeah, I'm Mayor Skip Hall from the City of Surprise. Very glad to be here. Mayor Lane, thank you for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you all for being here as well again. But uh, uh, I'm Jim Lane, a mayor here in Scottsdale. And we are hosting it this year. And we're, we're glad to be able to have the honor to do just exactly that with SciTech and with this uh, ninth annual STEM and Innovation Summit that's going on right here in Scottsdale. So thanks very much for that. Good morning. I'm Jen Daniels. I'm the mayor of Gilbert, Arizona, and just grateful to have been invited to participate in this and really excited about this topic. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Schof. I'm the mayor of the city of Litchfield Park. Uh, I actually have an engineering degree and in, in another life was the owner of a manufacturing company that became uh, significantly high tech and had locations here in the valley and, and understand firsthand the challenges of trying to operate a company that needs technology and that uses technology on a regular basis. So I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Good morning. Jerry Bean Wilner, mayor of the town of Paradise Valley, also uh, in my first term four years before that on the uh, Town Council in Paradise Valley. Thank you, Mayor Lane, and to the City of Scottsdale for hosting this important discussion. Excited to be here. Uh, we're all volunteers in our government, so <coughs> in addition to uh, public service, I uh, have a law practice and uh, invest, and I've had uh, some great experience in the business community, along with the, uh, the technology community as well, and uh, look forward to this discussion. Thank great. you. Well, let's get started. We'll uh, start with a big picture, and please feel free to um, jump in. Let's make this as interactive as possible. I hate when I see panels and, you know, it's kind of dull and stilted, so let's have fun today, even though it's a very serious topic. Um, so let's start with the overall big picture. Um, all you sitting around the table at mayors uh, are personally involved in recruiting and wooing uh, STEM companies, tech companies to your cities and towns. Um, you need to be an economic development strategist and a cheerleader and ch chief all at once. So let's uh, start with Mayor Ben Wilner. Um, can you give us uh, in Paradise Valley a recent success story about attracting a STEM-related employer to your city or town or something that has built momentum for STEM in your community? So we're a little bit um, different in that regard because we're primarily a residential um, community, but we do have a lot of leaders in the, the tech field that live in our community, so we get to hear from them. Um, I can give you some feedback on what we hear, and that's that uh, Arizona is a great business economy, business environment. I think a large part of that has been historically our predictability, and as a lawyer, I hear that as well. Our code is very easy to understand, our laws are easy to understand, they're implemented in a clear and straightforward way. So I think that's an important. Um, balance that historically has been struck in the state, while at the same time looking for opportunities um, to create the best quality of life for our citizens. So in Paradise Valley, we follow um, that model. We're not looking for, in our community, the employment side of it. But um, at, for example, when we look to engage with, with technology and communications, uh, we've been dealing with the, the cell phone industry to try to improve coverage. And we try to use that sort of philosophy, which is how do we dialogue with industry? How do we understand what their concerns are before we get into the regulatory and, and legislative side so that we're really being responsive and understanding what industry's concerns are and then how that fits into our community. So that's 
what I hear from leaders in our community and the business world, that they're very pleased with our state and with our, our peers that have been very innovative, and I'm excited to hear from them on some of their programs as far as attracting uh, business because I think there's been a tremendous amount of success around this table in doing that. But the feedback that I hear from those who are in those leadership positions has been excellent. Okay, great. Mayor Schof, anything you want to boast about in Litchfield Park? <laughs> How long do we have? Uh, a few minutes. We're, we're like we're very much like Paradise Valley in the in that the uh, we're a small, very small city. Uh, we're in a very small amount of land area and, and primarily uh, residential and resort with the Wigwam Resort. Uh, we are we are having some conversations with a a larger company that may establish a, one of their subsidiary headquarters in our in a new area that we're building in our downtown. So we're working on some of these things, but not at the same extent of somebody like Goodyear or, or even Surprise, I'm sure. So I will defer to, to their uh, expertise. Is there anything you want to talk about to break some news here, or can you reveal who you're talking to? You know, I can't. Okay. It's not quite that, not to that <laughs> level. It's, a, it's not quite at that level yet. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Daniels, a lot going on in Gilbert. Tell us about it. Yeah, we've... we've had a lot of growth over the last little while and super proud of and grateful for the individuals and companies who have invested in Gilbert. And I think probably the biggest announcement that we've had in the last decade really was probably bringing Deloitte State of Service Delivery Center to Gilbert and 3,000 jobs, um, all high wage jobs and all uh, really STEM related. And I think there's a few different components as to why this is important to us. One is we love the large employers that see value in giving back in our community and are, they are deeply involved in our schools. Um, they are deeply involved in some of the business networking that's going on and have elevated their positions really to a regional voice. Um, that now represents not only Deloitte, but also Gilbert. And so we've been really grateful for that. Um, as a mayor, one of my, I see one of my roles as being providing really the highest quality of life that we can for our residents with top tier educational options and um, really that true partnership and collaboration that I think we're all sort of seeking for. We know that success begets success. And so um, when a company like Deloitte comes in, and, and I love hearing them talk about their graduates that they're actually bringing into their company, they're telling us that the ASU grads that they're hiring from right there around us with ASU Poly and ASU's main campus as well as University of Arizona and the other um, programs that we have and, and educational opportunities, that they are some of the highest qualified and most workforce ready um, graduates that they can find. That's a great story to be able to tell that we're graduating um, students and finding them space in the work in the workplace at a, at a really a, a great advantage to this region. So we don't work in silos, we work together and I love that aspect. So Deloitte has been a great win, not just for Gilbert, but I think for the region as a whole. Great, great to hear about the ASU graduates since my son's a sophomore at Barrett Honor. So um, Mayor Lane, tell us what's going on Scott's own in STEM related jobs and things of that nature. Certainly nice uh, to have you here with us. So thank you thank very you. much on that officially. Um, I would just say, number one, that we've certainly had a lot of success over the years in actually building a critical mass in a number of areas, and, and we see this as a multi-tiered kind of uh, environment that has to be built to sort of support the very thing we're talking about here today, and that's STEM education and STEM-related industries feeding into that. So I was just going to mention there's a couple of recent ones, since that's the nature of the question, uh, to talk a little bit about a couple that are on that have come to us very recently and fill out and continue to enhance some of the elements that I think are important on all the ba on all basis. And, and number one is a company that we just have recently have set up shop here from out of New York City, uh, General Assembly. And when we talk about General Assembly and what they do, it's really a training facility, but it's frankly on a very sophisticated high line and it has a lot of different applications as it relates to training retraining and retaining uh, individual corporations, businesses, okay. and, and their personnel, and also uh, and obviously bringing them up to the specifics of what they need to know for their particular businesses. And I see that as a huge element. In fact, working, this is not an announcement officially, but we're starting conversations with some of our community college systems as to whether or not there's not some way to effect effectively and efficiently incorporate some of this 
into a program that could be an add uh, to those folks who are looking to get into technology at the level maybe beyond a four-year engineering, uh, or rather I should say prior to a four-year engineering degree. So those are some of the things as far as their concern. And of course, uh, as I say, it's like old fields of endeavor to transition to new fields of endeavor. That's one of the retraining aspects to taking people that are actually in a completely different area and not necessarily students. So I think that's a major component uh, for us to be uh, thinking about. And then most recently, and just a couple of days ago, uh, we had the grand opening for Infosys here uh, in Skysong, at Skysong. And Infosys is a consulting firm generally, but also a facilitator for other companies in the application of uh, technology and innovation. And it's a, a huge element of add to our entire community or throughout the valley and, and really specifically here in the valley. Uh, we're one of three innovation hubs for Infosys here in Scottsdale in the United States, and there are some 20 across the world. But in any case, that's another nice fill-in, and it, frankly, it's taking, and we do have these before, but this is a recent arrival and another extension on that, and that's a big win uh, from the standpoint of continuing that. And then one final one, and I don't mean to put this on a lesser note, but those recruitment companies now, or firms, that are coming forward that are recruiting just strictly and specifically for um, high-tech uh, positions. And that is the Frank uh, re uh, Recruitment Group that's here in Scottsdale now, too. Uh, but again, those are all elements that feed together to sort of give that whole picture. Great. So that'd be... Thanks for that recap. Let's go over to our friends in the West Valley and hear what's going on Surprise and uh, Goodyear. Mayor Thank Hall. You. Thank you. Yeah, we've had, uh, when we're talking about recent successes, we've had one success in uh, manufacturing and one success in medical and one <coughs> success in distribution, what I call distribution. In the manufacturing field, we've had, uh, we've had a company called Irish USA who set up their American headquarters in Surprise. It's a Japanese company. Uh, they build plastic boxes. So most of all the boxes you, you buy in uh, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, those are all manufactured by Iris. Okay, uh, but their manufacturing is robotic. And so we have, uh, we have really got a lot of the kids, the elementary kids in Surprise, to tour Irish USA to see the robotics and the programming that goes on for robotics, to get them thinking about career-oriented in software and coding, et cetera. Um, so that's one success. The other one is a, is a small company called MagQ, which is from Taiwan. And they are doing uh, uh, early research in Alzheimer to where, they, where, it's a, where you have a blood test, which is a marker in your blood, which shows that you have a proclivity for Alzheimer. And uh, so that, that's, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's the first step in the U.S. market for MagQ. Uh, the other one is a distribution company called UDELF, which picks surprise as it's test market for autonomous vehicle delivery of Walmart products. Oh, wow. So you call Walmart and you want something delivered. The UDEL vehicle is autonomous. It has a driver sitting in the passenger seat in case That's they have so to so take so. over. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, they're, they're, they've got three test markets, one in San Jose, California, one in San Antonio, Texas, and then Surprise is the third location where they're testing. And it's... Um, I think it's a real compliment to our economic development department because we have a, we have a business incubator in Surprise, which was our old city, t city hall, and we converted it to an incubator. And our economic development department has developed a concierge program for soft landing of companies. So when they come in, they, uh, if they're doing recruitment, we help them with recruitment, if they, et cetera. Uh, training, uh, we set up meeting rooms for them all that kind of stuff to make them feel welcome. Because we're a young city, and we're 80% of our residents drive out of the city of Surprise to go to work. And we need, we need to reverse that. And it's going to take time. Like Mayor Lynn said, it's, there's a lot of ingredients to make a real healthy, vibrant STEM city, a high-tech city. And sure. uh, from education to training to, to recruitment, all that comes into play. So. Anyway, that's, that's been our three recent successes. Thank you. 
Mayor Lord, a lot going on in Goodyear, we read in the papers. Well, we've been very fortunate. I count my blessings. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to start out with the latest information because we have, uh, we have been preparing for this time for a long time. The infrastructure, the quality of life in Goodyear, the schools. Um, so it's been, it's been a, a goal of the council uh, and staff. And uh, of course, we've um, started a tech boulevard. Bullard. All right, so we've been working on this, and you know, it's, it's really something. You just look around, you have all this land, it never comes, never comes, and then all of a sudden, somebody threw flower seed over a good year, and it is popping up all <laughs> over. And um, it, it's, um, you hate to be a bragger, so you try to be, you know, calm about it, but it is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to us. And uh, you think of one Microsoft would be good? but you get the second one, and then you think, okay, now we have two, two techs, separate sides of the city, and then you get, um, you get uh, Stream Data Center, and then you get Compass Data Center, and then you get Vantage Data Center, and so, you know, that is a great investment for our city, because those companies bring one-time money in, and that one-time money builds a fire station. So it improves, it adds a few policemen, it sure. improves, that's the money you can spend. And you don't think about that normally, uh, but that one-time money is, is the money that you really invest in your city. So we're extremely pleased by this. Um, it gives our residents new opportunities. We have a highly educated uh, uh, population in Goodyear. I think it kind of brings the education up a little bit because then it gives the schools opportunities to know what high-tech companies do right. uh, and uh, become familiar with it. So we're excited um, and I'll go more on. It's just that um, this is a great group of mayors you have here today, all right? We meet a lot and do a lot together and we have a lot of conversation going on in the Valley and it is so nice to be able to share ideas. And we've learned a lot from Phoenix and Scottsdale and Chandler. I remember when I first became mayor, I uh, took a trip to Chandler. I said, why did they have all these wonderful companies? <laughs> well, I heard that years ago, they had a council that put infrastructure in. They didn't have any flowers blooming. They just had land with underneath the dirt. How smart they were. And I said, well, I want to be a Chandler. You know, let's put things under the ground. Let's get ready for when that opportunity comes, we'll be able to close on it. Great, thank you. Well, let's hear what's going on in the city of Phoenix, Mayor Gallego. Excellent. So we've really been trying to invest and move toward advanced economy jobs. We're at about 44% before the recession, and now we are at 63% and growing. Uh, during the campaign, I was teased that I wanted to make Phoenix nerdier. <laughs> but I feel like this is the room where I can embrace that. Yes. So we are trying to do that. Uh, one new company that we're very excited about is the headquarters of Nikola Motors. Uh, I was someone who grew up with asthma as a young person and very interested in air quality, and they are moving towards zero emission vehicles. So they have long haul semi trucks uh, with hydrogen, electric drivetrains, mm -hmm. really modern transportation systems. I think they have 14,000 vehicles on order right now, so a very bright future. They have their headquarters, they moved to Phoenix. And they're also doing R&D in Phoenix, but it is not just a Phoenix win. They're going to be doing manufacturing in rural Arizona. So I think one of those instances where a rising tide lifts many communities yeah. and an exciting win for Phoenix. Great. Um, why don't we stay with Mayor Gallego? Why don't we have each of uh, the mayors talk about how your cities or towns are positioned for the future um, for STEM-related jobs or employers? Um, how would you assess yourselves now? What do you need to get better at? What are the pluses, minuses, and some of the challenges moving forward in this rapidly changing economy? If you want to go first, Mayor Gallego. We think a lot about our workforce, and that starts with early childhood, so we're having our Head Start programs do more and more with STEM and STEAM, STEAM being including arts in that, um, trying to make sure our libraries have ability to do coding and robotics, going through our high schools where we partnered with our Phoenix Union High School District to create programs such as the Bioscience High School. Um, we work very closely with our community colleges and universities 
and are really trying to do partnerships at all level. Um, one that's probably new in the last decade is really working to more medical education in this community. We were, not too long ago, the largest county in the country without those real resources. Phoenix was the largest city without a medical school. Our voters gave us strong support with a bond package to bring first the University of Arizona to our downtown on land that was put together originally to pursue a, a football stadium. And now we've gotten billions of dollars of economic impact from instead of getting football, nice. getting medical education. Uh, we are also working with Arizona State and have supported their facilities as they've worked with Mayo. And I, I learned when I became mayor of Phoenix, I am also the chair of the uh, facilities district for Park Central Mall, where we are building parking and other amenities to help bring Creighton Medical School, their nursing program, allied health program. So we are not the ones educating doctors, but we are helping create the physical space where that happens. And part of that, making Phoenix nerdier. Great, great, great. Um, mayor Lord, a uh, lot of stuff going on in Goodyear. Um, how do you assess what's happening and what uh, the city can do better or prepare better for the future? Someone had mentioned infrastructure, which is not the most exciting topic. You mentioned it in yeah. terms of Chandler, um, but that's super important as all mayor and city leaders know. So tell us a little more about what we can look for a good year in the future. We can always do better, but we have a pretty fantastic staff. And the former city manager took time to bring lean in, to reorganize the thought process. And when I started, I was started, I was a salesperson, all right, selling homes. So service is very important to me. And every time I greet a new employee, I say, you are in the service business, and so am I. And we serve 80-some thousand people. And that can be hard work sometimes. That can be positive thinking and not negative words coming out of your mouth. Um, and so we saw efficiency being uh, incorporated in every department through these programs at the city manager. And I would have had the delightful time to being going around to the departments and sh they showed me the minutes they cut off of their day or how fast the process was. And so we came, became very unique. So when these companies have been coming to us, they have been very impressed uh, that we have a continuum when they come and we sit down at the table with them uh, and it's not fragmented. So they don't have to wait and go to this department to get done and go to that. We work as a team um, and time is money. I learned that in real estate. When you have bridge loans, right? You gotta get on it right away. Same way with the development. And so I would say that's where we've become expertise. And um, it takes a congenial council. Uh, it takes a city manager that will take some risks. And uh, so you put it all together, and it's really fun in the end. It's not done, but right now we're in the happy time. Good. Well, I wish all of you to have congenial councils. That's my blessing for my wish for all of you. Uh, Mayor Hall, surprised you talked about some of the challenges with 80% of the folks, uh, surprise residents, leaving to go to jobs. How can you? How are you guys trying to turn that around or transform that in the coming years? Yes, a um, <clears throat> couple of things. Um, we've had two big things happen in Surprise in the last two years. One, we opened a four-year residential university. That was huge for our community. Uh, they're doing a $50 million expansion right now. Uh, they're going to open their student union building, their athletic center, their, um, there's another building. <laughs> anyway, uh, they're going to open that in next month. Uh, they've got a football field. They got 29 sports. Uh, very good football team, by the way. How about the uh, tennis? Are they using your tennis courts? Yeah, they're using our tennis courts. They're using our baseball field. So we got a lot of partnership that way going. So it's a really, really unique partnership between a four-year university and a city. Uh, and what's the name of the school? Just so everyone it's knows. It's Ottawa University. Okay. They've been in the adult education field for mm -hmm. quite some time in the Phoenix market, but this is their first. Their campus in Kansas is 1863. So they've been around a while. Uh, but anyway, the second thing is we've got a, that just opened in Surprise, 
is uh, a vocational school called Westmec, and it's gonna, it has uh, 25 disciplines is gonna be taught. So right now they're at about nine, but they're expanding. They're just getting ready to open the rest of their campus. It'll be up to 25 disciplines. So the synergy between a four-year residential university and a vocational school that teaches technical, hands-on, is going to be fantastic. And then we've got, a, we've got a new superintendent of our schools who's very, very into technology. And um, uh, that's going to, it's going to pay big dividends throughout our sco the school system there. And surprise, okay. we have 25,000 students in our school system. Uh, just in the public school system. But 25% of the kids in Surprise are taught at the charter schools. So we have a big charter school footprint in Surprise. Um, the, uh, the one thing I need, I, I want to bring up too is that we are looking, we have 19% of our residents are over the age 60. I think we're only second to Scottsdale in the United States. <laughs> it's not such a bad thing. No, I know. But, but as, you get, as you get older, like me, you have more oh, medical needs. Oh, tell us about it. Come on. <laughs> just just whine so, <laughs> a little bit for me today. Yeah. So we are, we are, we're, we're, uh, we're really focusing on how we, can, how we can serve that component uh, of age. And, of course, we're adjacent to two big sun cities, Sun City and Sun City West. So there's also that. And Banner has, a, uh, has quite a, but we want to develop more medical. And Ottawa, as, as a university, is going to be a big part of that, developing that piece of it, from nursing to PAs to, to whatever, OK? OK? The other thing we're working on, and I hope I'm not, I hope it's OK I talk about this, Janine, uh, <laughs> is that we are working on uh, Canadian medical. We feel, with all the visitors from Canada, that, that a hip replacement in December in Toronto has got to be really tough, okay, versus Phoenix, Arizona, or the Phoenix market. Um, and when you, look at, when you look at the doctors up there, I think they'd rather be, do the hip replacements down here in the winter than up there. So we're working on how we can make that how we can make that happen it's fraught with a lot of politics okay because they have an insurance system mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out how to navigate that so it's reimbursable for a canadian that comes down here to visit who needs a knee replacement who doesn't have to fly back to canada to do it yep. okay so that's a, that's that's a big piece so thank those you. are okay thank you mayor lane a lot of positive things happening in scottsdale with the tech industry you talked about a lot of the success stories. How do you as a mayor uh, keep that and the council and the city keep that ball rolling and that momentum going in a positive direction? Is there an interplay, Skip, that you were talking about with that with regard to STEM-related education and, and that tie-in as far as that's concerned? Yes. That would be, be fine. Okay, and I'll, I'll try to follow on that okay. line. Uh, I do have to say to, to Mayor Hall that uh, uh, for years, I've been saying that I'm personally responsible for dragging that 65 and older uh, number up. You know, so, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's my contribution. <laughs> but in, in any case, <laughs> in any case, uh, and, and frankly, that's a great population of people, as we can both attest for ourselves. <laughs> but in, in, in any case, one of the things I suppose that is important to continue to remember is uh, that this is, is all one picture. And one of we've had a number of direct types of interplay with our educational systems, inclusive of the university system, as well as our secondary education, and also partnerships with other schools and, and learning institutions uh, with regard to just what our overall plan and thinking is. And one of the areas has been health care uh, and uh, our cure corridor and what we do on a collaborative basis, but really, frankly, not from a government play but to really to be able to facilitate that interplay with those institutions so the best can come from all sectors, particularly when you have technological innovations that are lending a dramatic new play. Uh, everybody can see the benefit of making sure that people are all aware they're not siloed and, and mm -hmm. in their given areas of things. So our play, though, with STEM-related education really goes to the point that we're building that base of opportunities 
And at first, we really had to entice or mine from other areas of the country uh, businesses in the technology field to come to Scottsdale. We were known as a place to retire, a place to play golf, uh, and that was pr and a resort town. So one of the first obstacles we had really was to transition CEOs principally, because working for uh, consultants, economic, uh, I should say uh, relocation consultants, didn't play well because they weren't getting the same message uh, because they were looking for different things than the CEOs were concerned. But we, we have built that critical mass, and that has created an environment of some excitement and opportunity that's seen by not only uh, students, uh, sometimes they're not as engaged as their parents might be. So as people came and we grew that population of opportunity, it became almost, and we increased the demand for that uh, STEM-related education, uh, there's been a response by most of the educational institutions, and certainly at the forefront of that is ASU, uh, on the engineering department and what they've done in, at ASU. But all of them have uh, understood generally in the marketplace that they have a real obligation. There's no real reason that we have to, um, we don't want to be taking over the school systems or anything like that or telling them how to run their schools and their curriculums, but we do want to make sure that Exposure. they're responding yeah, yeah. to the, the environment. So. We lay it out as to what opportunities are there. And so we build on uh, an ever-growing strength in the technology, high-tech sector of things, and, and demonstrate with statistics and everything that are widely circulated. Not only that, this is a dynamic new industry. It's transitional. It's like going from uh, horse and carriage to the horseless carriage. You know, it's, uh, these, these are a lot of things have to change. And one of them is what people are trained to do and what the opportunity it holds. So it's, uh, that's communicated on a routine basis, but we do have a number of circumstances where we have engaged specifically with school systems in letting them know, even to the point of uh, visits to our sister city, bringing Mandarin and teachers back to Scottsdale mm -hmm. to teach Mandarin in our schools. This is some 10 years ago. But that's, that's a small element as far as when we talk about things like that. But the Saguaro robot, uh, robotics team and, and what we do in engaging them with some of the businesses that are here in Scottsdale. Uh, Neuro is, the, is a prime example, and that's autonomous delivery vehicles. So they've been here. So, and doing that. And also our chamber has been actively engaged in trying to mentor uh, our student population with some of the folks who uh, can work into uh, pushing that uh, into the classroom and into a student's mind. Um, the other end is the Charles. Is another civic organization here in Scottsdale for many, many years and has always been engaged in, in celebrating education and, and scholarships for uh, student population and also for teachers. So that's the interplay. It's maybe a little more subtle than others. The Cure Corridor I mentioned, even that's meant to be a little bit more subtle. Uh, this isn't a government-directed deal. It's a matter of saying, hey, in fact, it's privately funded and, and put together. We, we orchestrate it, but nevertheless, to, to give that interplay and to have that exchange mm -hmm. uh, with, within the population. Correct. Well, um, Mayor Daniels, let's shift the question a little bit because all of you sitting here on the front lines of hearing what entrepreneurs and CEOs and innovators are looking for in a town or city, um, especially STEM-related, whether it's digital, what, what have you. Um, what has Gilbert tried to do? What feedback have you received from those types of company CEOs? What are they looking for in a city, in an area, in a region, and how can you accommodate them? Well, we know what they want because we've been asking them on a fairly regular basis. What do you need from us? Um, what can we do to either get out of the way or to assist you in, in what you need in order to be successful? And I think that's a really important conversation that we continue to go back to them because their needs change and what we can offer changes as well. Um, I, in those conversations, lots of discussion about transportation and transportation-related options, high-quality infrastructure, really predictable environment for them to operate in, both from a tax and a regulation standpoint, but also um, just from a, a community-wide or regional network. Um, they need some predictability in that. Um, do we all work together? Is there uh, collaboration and forward thinking? We have a City of the Future initiative in Gilbert, and so we're constantly looking at ways that we can be more flexible in our planning, 
Um, if you think about how fast the world is changing, that flexibility is going to be critically important for us in order to be successful in the future. That means we have to rethink how we do streets and roadways. That means we need to rethink how we deliver a high-speed internet connection to our businesses, um, securing our water future and how important that is for the long-term success of all of our communities. And so when we are talking about these things with our CEOs and with those who are interested in this region, those are the conversations that we're having. And I think what you'll find by, by and large is that we are an adaptable region because we're not old. We're a very young region, and we have far more opportunities to adapt than a lot of our aging counterparts in any other part of the country where they're really, frankly, set in how they um, transport people and or ideas. Um, I love the fact that we can be very agile in, in this region, and I think it speaks by and large to the focus that we have on being successful in the future. Right. Um, Mayor Schof uh, and Mayor Ben Wilner, because you guys have smaller towns, smaller municipalities, um, what, do you, what have CEOs told you are some of the difficulties or challenges and how can you overcome that in attracting you know, STEM-related companies? We, we see it more in terms of how do we attract the kinds of residents that we want, which are the CEOs or the leaders of these high-tech companies. And there's a variety of things that are important to them, but one of the one of the most crucial items is education, particularly our elementary and our and our secondary education. Uh, we're fortunate in that we have one of the best uh, elementary districts in the state. Uh, we consistently have a number of schools. You know, Litchfield Litchfield Elementary for sure. The last five years has been an A plus rated school. We have other. Uh, elementary schools within the within the district overall so Goodyear Avondale also have schools that are a plus rated so that's that's a very important uh, very important feature and our high school is getting uh, it's gotten a lot better and then quite frankly is, is one of the better rated high schools on the west side I personally have gotten significant I spent a lot of time on education uh, as a just on a personal note you know, I think everybody here knows that, that, that city, cities are completely separate from, from the school districts. School districts run the schools, and cities have very little to say about it. But I have found by establishing relationships with superintendents that we can look at some things and ask questions and try to get some answers for some really basic questions. And the, the one that has occupied me for the last couple of years is why do, you, why do certain third grade classes do really well and others do not so well, and yet their demographics are really similar. You know, it's not, and it's not, you, you can't just point to family income, you can't point to things that you'd say, well, it's because they don't have as many fathers at home, or you know, things that you would think would be a normal indicator. When you get into the data, it, it, it's, it doesn't point that way. There's something else going on that makes these individual classrooms different. So I have spent time over the last couple of years with the superintendents and the staffs of the schools to try to understand the data that's coming out of these, these classrooms and how it might tell us, you know, give us some insight into why they're different. And interestingly enough, I don't know, you may not have noticed, but one of our, literally one of the highest performing districts in the entire state and the, one of the best districts in terms of using data to try to understand why these different classrooms are different is Avondale, Elemen Avondale Elementary. Mm -hmm. They have a very significant grant from a big foundation on the, in the east and they have spent it uh, really understanding how do we measure the way we provide education to these children and how do we measure the outcomes on literally a daily basis so they can track how their classes are doing and they can really predict how these kids are doing. And, and again, it's not, it's not based upon some of the things you might think of. So those are the kind of initiatives that are important really for my residents. I, all of our residents in Litchfield Park are engaged in the schools. Uh, and and those, those school districts are very, very important to our future. Right. Mayor now, I would like to interject, and so yeah. you know on the West Valley is that we're a team, so our children go to the Litchfield uh, district. Right. So we have five districts, so we're all inter intertwined. Sure. So Avondale School District. So um, it's extremely important for us, as Tom says, uh, to be unique and att give attention to the schools and help where they can. And they have, we even have round tables of the superintendents and the principals that come and we have a discussion along with the churches in the school and to meet the needs of those students that are, might have some financial problems and some things that they can't 
uh, produced to be successful in school. So I just wanted to confirm sure. that you, you wanted this conversation. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, maybe, uh, the, mayor, the mayor knows another, how I interrupt. Another yes. feature of this several years ago, uh, the, mayors, the mayors, I think, were part of this whole effort, but on the, on the west side, is working with the districts to try to understand why kids leave elementary school and they're not prepared for high school. Why don't they leave high school and they can't, and they're not prepared to go into either community college or ASU? So that our, the articulation in between the districts was not, was not coordinated, and they weren't sharing with each other what they were doing to prepare. And that has improved tremendously, and it's helped our kids a lot as they go from the, each of these steps in the education system. Correct. Well, the mayor from Paradise Valley is very patient. It's taken a while to get back to you, so you chime in on this topic. Not at all. I'm yeah. glad to hear from uh, all of my colleagues, and there's a tremendous amount of. Uh, as I've heard and everyone's heard, great work that's going on throughout the Valley. And that's one of the things that I think we can highlight, and I'll get specific about Paris Valley, but we're the fastest in the fastest growing county in the country. And looking around the table and our other colleagues who aren't here, we have such diversity of choice. So I think all the ingredients are there. Um, people can move here, people can stay here, they can move within the community. And each city and town has something a little bit different to offer, which is maybe different than other geographic areas where things start to kind of all look the same. Um, we do have that diversity here, and I think the diversity is, is a form of strength for this, this community in this region. As far as what I hear from CEOs and, and in that community, uh, just a few things on that, and it echoes a lot of what I've heard from uh, uh, my esteemed colleagues here. Um, I had lunch, privilege of having lunch of, within the last 10 days with a former CEO of a New York Stock Exchange listed company. And one thing that he shared with me that I hear from a lot of folks is um, he doesn't go into the office anymore. He prefers not to. So he does a lot of his business on his phone, um, with his computer, at his home. So what does that get at? That gets at our connectivity and our infrastructure, which Mayor Lord and others were highlighting. And one thing we're doing in Paradise Valley uh, in connection with our upcoming general plan, and we've already started doing, and I've encouraged that our, our staff does, and they've already been on top of this, is looking at low-cost opportunities to um, put infrastructure in place, even if it's not being utilized. A good example of that would be when we do a major road remodel, we should be looking at what it costs us to put conduit in so we can put fiber in later on, and we're not having to tell people, well, we can't get the next level of internet connectivity because the infrastructure is not there and we'd have to tear up a street. Those are low-cost things that can be done in advance that can pay huge dividends, not just for our town, but for the region. Um, education is obviously a huge component. I mean, to me personally, it's, it's the foundation of this great American exper experiment is to have a great educational system. And that's important for those of us who are here in this community. But when we think about attracting folks from out of state and bringing in innovation from out of state, one of the first questions you get is, what are the schools like? So what we've done in Paradise Valley, what I've tried to do is encourage um, growth and, and connectivity in the schools. And sometimes that takes work. It takes work in connecting the schools with the neighborhoods, talking to people, getting those plans out there, getting folks comfortable with the idea that in order to have a great uh, top educational system, sometimes there will be disruption next to a school. Sometimes you will have construction, but looking at the long-term benefits of having that connectivity with the educational system and the community and looking for ways to enhance those connections is, is important. And from our perspective, we don't look at the delivery. And I think at a, at a kind of a statewide and a national level, there's a lot of discussion about the delivery, whether it's public or private or charter. And those are important discussions. But at, in, at the PV level, we just want people to know that we want people's kids to get great educations, whether that's at a, a preschool that's run by a church or a synagogue or whether it's at a private school like the Jones Gordon School, which deals with special educational needs, or PCDS, or our great Scottsdale public school district schools that are in Paradise Valley. But just having that foundation here, that's what people look at, especially in the STEM community. They have those educational, strong educational backgrounds. They want to make sure that's there for their children. And we should all want to make sure, and I know everyone around this table wants to make sure that's there um, for the kids that are, are learning today and the generations going forward. Great, thanks for the comments. Let's shift over to Mayor Gallego. A lot of the, your uh, peers have brought up schools and education. And, and as you know, as mayor of the fifth largest city in the country, <laughs> that nexus between strong schools and educated workforce is so crucial. 
Um, but we've had some challenges in Arizona, you know, with, you know, there's been stories about teacher salaries, uh, about, you know, teacher shortages. And tell us about in a diverse city uh, like Phoenix, where you have many different ethnic backgrounds, uh, people of color, how we can uh, strengthen our schools. And I know as mayor, you're not over the school district, but you have a powerful voice. Each of you do, as you can use a bully pul pulpit of being a mayor. Talk about how we can build that at the grassroots level with, you know, you mentioned Head Start, so that that momentum will continue until these kids are going to college. Absolutely. As a mayor, I feel like any dollars you can put into early childhood are dollars that are well spent and that you see results for years to come. I've really enjoyed partnering with First Things First, which uh, has dollars to invest in, in early childhood, and they'll work with us at places like our city housing, at our libraries. Um, we've created parenting centers in the city of Phoenix, which is wonderful. As the mother of a two-year-old, sometimes it's just nice to have someone to ask for advice or, or talk about, uh, for example, my son will only eat things right now that are brown, uh, chicken nuggets being at the top of the list. <laughs> And he, he started uh, preschool two weeks ago. They asked everyone what he wanted to be, what they all wanted to be. Almost everyone in the class wanted a STEM field, uh, mostly doctors. But my son wants to grow up and be a monster truck. Nice. <laughs> nice. So always good to have partnerships with First Thing First to help you navigate parenting. And I think those are investments that will continue to pay dividends. We love working with our schools and have had great partnerships. Uh, we have the Ball School District in Phoenix, which is near the airport. It's an incredibly diverse district. I think 20 languages spoken at home. Um, it's home to a lot of our refugee community, uh, individuals who have very inspiring stories of how they, they came to Arizona, but very diverse backgrounds. So some people who came to Arizona having lived without electricity or running water. And so we are asking a lot of this school district, and they've been great about stepping up. Uh, they worked with us on a manufacturing academy for middle school students. And so middle school is a really important time where parents and students are making decisions about career and where, where you want to be spending your time and interests. And the city is, uh, particularly with economic development, we can be a great connector to local businesses so that they can get in and, and see what's happening. So, so you talk, Mayor Hall spoke about seeing that robotics in action, making it really tangible and real. These are things happening in our community and, and you can learn about it. Uh, we also have had robotics clubs that have said, help us come up with challenges you have at the city and we'll solve them for you. And we love the idea of ha using our great, brilliant students to solve our local problems. I think if you do that, you might get hooked and, and it's really a credit to Phoenix when we get stories about Carl Hayden High School robotics team possibly beating MIT. Mm -hmm. So we, we love working with our schools. Um, one that's been really fun for me over the last year is uh, before serving as mayor, represented the South Mountain area on the city council. And South Mountain High School is setting up academies in areas such as aerospace, which is such a win for us right by the airport. So they are giving us that pipeline we need. We've all been talking about workforce, and we can't do it without our schools. Yeah, great. Mayor Lord, what can mayors or cities and towns do to strengthen and build our e STEM ecosystem and build a STEM culture. What do you think the appropriate role is? What, is? what do you view your role as, even as mayor, and you're not over, you're not a school superintendent? Right, well, as the mayor said, Tom, that we're very close to the schools. Um, we help in any way we can, we sh we're show up. You know, I always say, if you show up, it says you're interested, and so many people don't show up. The other thing we can emphasize is the uh, printed material that goes out to our public in form of, uh, you know, magazines and newspapers about Arizona, and somehow they always downgrade our education. So w they compare us to other states. Well, we're a military family. We've moved 22 times. Every state is different. Every state uses a different test. Every state has a whole different system. And so I. I object when I see this. We have at least four to six schools that uh, have a STEM program now, and your residents, children, are uh, taking advantage of that outside of the Litchfield, and I know Litchfield School has it too, so we do have it. Um, I think we just need to be sure to uh, reinforce the success of the schools uh, instead of always tearing them apart. And, I noticed the difference in Arizona is, 
is that residents are more apt to tell the school what they need to teach and how they need to teach it. Along with, I want my kids to, to be, I want this social thing taught, I want this. And so that makes a very busy day in a classroom when they have to be responsible for that. And then what we need to do, and I'm going to tell a story about myself. So uh, in eighth grade, I had algebra. I had a very difficult time with it. And my mother tried to encourage me because um, she did it at a certain age of her life too. And so I passed it finally. But this is what the teacher said. Don't you ever take another math course. I grew up with that. Now, I'm retired, and I go into the real estate business, and all of a sudden, I'm told I'm going to do mortgages. I'm going to put people in different, all right? And so I'm going to learn a whole new process. I was so successful, and to this day, it haunts me that that teacher told me I wasn't good at something. And we need to tell our children that are struggling in the school, we need to find an area that they succeed in, and we need to nurture them. It needs to be done from the home, it needs to be the school, from the church, from whoever is around to help those children excel. And we have a number of children in school, due to circumstances of home life, they struggle. And we need to be paying attention to them. Well, thank so, you for that. Who would think that woman that couldn't do a algebra problem would be a mayor, you know, yeah. and, and handle budgets? So just a small story I'm yeah, going to share like with it. you. Well, you weren't the only one who struggled with algebra, so. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> mayor Hall, um, I noticed that you've done some STEM work at uh, Dysart, you know, with Dysart schools. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and what your involvement is? Yeah, sure. And, and just, just to uh, Councilman, or, uh, Mayor, I'm, Mayor, Mayor now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Mayor Lord's point about education and a teacher involvement. I I can tell you right now, if it hadn't been for football and basketball, I don't think I'd have graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean also to our students? In other words, we gotta give kids a reason to come to school and stay in school. And sometimes it's not algebra that keeps them there. It's the football. <laughs> or the basketball, or the art, or being on the band. You know, so our schools need to be not just hard science, technology, whatever. It's got, there's got to be art involved and drama and all the rest of it to keep kids interested and engaged. But anyway, um, we, as a, we as a city, as, uh, everybody's brought up connectivity, and that, that's so huge. And it's not only physical connectivity, I would call it a social infrastructure. And the reason I think, uh, I'm thinking about that, and Mayor Daniels, I'm sure, is thinking about it too, is that we are young cities. We haven't been around that long. Phoenix has been around for a while. We are very young cities, so we don't have the social infrastructure that cities have been around for a while. And I'm talking about examples like Friends of the Library. It's a very great organization and surprise. It's young. And it donates a lot of money to schools for read for reading, et cetera. So that that that's that's one right there. Read on Arizona. That's a new organization in Surprise, but it's building momentum. So it's helping the education component. And the reason I bring those up is because I'm involved in both those organizations as a mayor. And I encourage my council people to get involved. Go to their meetings, learn what they're talking, learn what they're doing. How do they, how do they make money? Where do they donate the money? How many teachers are involved, et cetera, okay? And then I have a, then I, then I have a, uh, a reading challenge that I do every year, and it usually involves about 2,500 students. And it's a bingo game. And it's a, real, it's a fun bingo game, and you have to do certain things in each square, et cetera. And it's signed off by the parents, and it goes to the teacher, and there's a teacher award, and there's a class award, and all the rest of it, okay? So we, I, I think we've been doing that five years now. And it's, so it gets people involved, but it gets me involved too, and adults involved. So uh, that's, that's another thing we're doing. The other thing is there's a school called Shadow Ridge High School. I just need to bring this up. Because, and this is my fault, and this is our city council's fault really, is that we don't do a good enough job of communicating the successes of our schools to our residents. And using examples, okay? 
for instance, Shadow Ridge High School has got an amazing architectural program. Well, how was it funded? Siemens company out of Germany funded it. Hmm. Wow. All the computers are Siemens. So you go into their class, I went into their class, and here they are, these kids are designing a restaurant with CAD CAM. Okay, now they've got a teacher who is super passionate, back to, back to the encouraging. You gotta have the teacher that's passionate about it. Uh, and he's teaching these kids how to use a CAD CAM program. So now, is that important for, uh, is it reinforcement of a city? Yeah, it's important that I go to that class and I say, great job to that teacher, and I show the kids that I, I think it's important, okay, from a city standpoint, that has, that has benefit, but we need, we need to, we as a city, in surprise, need to do a better job communicating successes to our normal residents. And I'm talking about the people that vote, the 19% over 60 that <laughs> vote, <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and so we, we just gotta do a better job of that. We're developing a new IGA with our school district, okay, so that all the, all the assets that the school has are taxpayer owned, okay? We share that. Everything we, we own as a city and everything that this, this, the, the Dysart School District uses is taxpayer owned. So let's make it more accessible to all our students. Fields, gymnasiums, all those kind of things. You gotta work through all that stuff. Oh, we, oh there's a security problem. We'll figure out the security problem, okay? Let's figure it out. And that's, that's what we're doing right now with Dice Art School District, so that our kids have more access to more assets throughout the city. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Marilyn? Skip, I don't know whether yeah. you're, you're <laughs> going to move this question to me or not, but nevertheless, I did want to just add something that uh, Mayor Hall really uh, expressed rather well in a much more sophisticated way than I'm about to say. Years ago, I'm going to say six, seven years ago, if you're familiar with the salt and pepper cartoons in the Wall Street Journal, they had this, they had this cartoon, and it was the parents watching their son play games, and they're distressed a little bit about it, but they have a bubble dream, and it has a oh, wanted okay. ad, and it says, wanted, 10 years experience gaming, $100,000 a year to start <laughs> home at the beach, you know, those kinds of things. And I thought there's a certain amount of interest when you think about exactly what uh, Mayor Hall's talking about as far as how do you excite, or how do you engage, how do you find the aptitude sometimes and at the same time, making sure we break down barriers, any kind of social, ethnic, racial, or whatever barriers that might somehow, or cultural barriers, uh, to your point, maybe. I don't, I, I don't know that that person was thinking maliciously, but they may have been thinking just. I think it was his process the way he taught. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's just, and, yeah. and it's, that's the kind of thing that really needs to change yeah. to open up the doors, but also to make sure that people, we don't want to be into social engineering on this subject. I mean, that's what happened in this old Soviet Union and, uh, and uh, communist China. Uh, so that's not our, our line of thinking, but at the same time, how do we find that happy place uh, somebody who's engaged in that, wants to be engaged in it, and does well. And if they're not, well, then there's other things certainly they can do. But nevertheless, I, I did want to just add that. I didn't know whether you were going to pass that question to me, but I didn't want to miss that opportunity to, to sort of lay the wisdom of salt and pepper with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's go to Mayor Daniels. You're the leader of a young, growing community. Um, I know Mayor Lane has been in favor of some school overrides here in Scottsdale. I believe you have been, you've been a big supporter of Gilbert Public Schools. Um, talk about that balance you strike as mayor about wanting strong schools but giving the school district their autonomy and how that will help build a STEM ecosystem here in Arizona and your community of Gilbert. You bet. So um, I have 80,000 school-aged children in Gilbert, and four of them are my own. So I care deeply about education. We have three school districts, actually, in Gilbert. Um, along with 33 charter schools and private schools. So um, for the first time ever, I've brought all those superintendents and the leaders of those charter schools together around the same table, and we talk about the really important initiatives that are occurring, and that's an important component of how we communicate. Um, for so long, I think a lot of our tri charters are actually siloed from our district schools. In fact, when we first convened this group about two years ago, it was very shocking to me that none of our charter school representatives had heard of the education dashboard that uh, Expect More Arizona mm -hmm. and the Helios Foundation and others have been very much educating on. And I thought, why? I mean, our school districts had probably heard the presentation two dozen times at that point. 
but our charter schools and most of our charter school operators had never heard of the education dashboard. So just to show you a little bit of the disconnect there. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit controversial when it comes to education. My mom was a lifelong educator, um, taught kindergarten and first grade for 25 years in California where I grew up, and I, um, I think we need to completely dismantle our education system, not just in Arizona, but across this country. Um, it's time for a total overhaul when it comes to education and not because we've been doing it wrong. We've been doing it the way that we know how to do it. And I still think we're one of the most successful countries in the world because we have done really well when it comes to educating our youth, but our workforce is changing and the needs of our workforce is changing. So not only do the need, are the, is, is technology changing this, this country, um, but very much the workforce needs are changing. No longer are we gonna be able to find a, a graduate from college who wants to do five years of school, which is essentially what they have to do now to become a certified teacher and then be an expert in 156 different competency areas, mm -hmm. and then go work in a single classroom with really the luck of the draw when it comes to the 30 students that they're gonna end up with in their class, stick with those students for an entire year, and then pass them along to the next grade. We have to rethink how we do this if we're gonna meet the needs of the youth, and if we're gonna meet the needs of that workforce. Um, I love hearing uh, Carol Basile from the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at ASU. She has some really innovative ideas. I know a lot of our districts are actually working in that space. I know Kyrene School District has undertaken quite a few different initiatives. Our Gilbert Public Schools has as well. So I really think we need to rethink how we educate, um, how we direct our youth, and really, frankly, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on those areas where our youth maybe aren't as strong um, and yet, uh, competency, it, it, you know, a basic competency level is going to be an important component, but let's really focus on the strengths of our youth. Their minds are brilliant. Um, I will also touch on the fact that um, we're moving towards, in the next 20 years, where 10% of our workforce will be somewhere on the autism spectrum. Are we prepared as a community to access that genius that is within mm. those individuals? It's something we talk about um, a lot. Uh, several years ago, I had a mom tell me that this is not a disability, this is actually evolution. And the way their brains work is perfectly tailored to the world of the future. Are we, our managers, is our education, are we actually changing the way that we teach and are we adapting um, and, and frankly moving away from some of those traditional success skills that we would consider to be an important component of getting a job? Um, if that's solely what we're focused on, uh, the degree and then those that long list of success skills, um, we're going to miss out on an entire population of genius that we need to be incorporating into our overall economy for their sake and for ours. And so I think we need to shift in lots of different areas, but um, controversial, I, I know, um, but dismantling education and rebuilding it in the for, really for the future is going to be a critical component. Well, thanks for those comments. Let's, I want to stay with you for a second. So if you could wave your magic wand, what are one or two things you'd like to see overhauled? If you want, have any thoughts on, when you say you want to totally dismantle it, what would, what would you like to do if you Yeah, were... so one of the concepts that I think is a critical component is team teachers, um, where you have a teacher that might be an expert in, let's say, English and reading or reading intervention, and those individuals solely teach that subject. So you actually have a lot of rotation throughout, a lot of community communication between parents, uh, student, and teachers, um, but you basically are building a team around a child, and that team actually stays with the child, um, which is an important component to see their success all the way through, and you, what you, I think ultimately what you'll see is that the child begins to learn how to drive their education, that they're, we hold their hands for a little while, but by the time they get to be where my oldest is, he's a sophomore in mm -hmm. high school, he's 16 years old, um, his education should be in his hands at this point. We're giving him the keys to a car, but we're not gonna give him keys to the success of his future until he's a little bit older. I think that they are fully capable of making a, a lot of those types of decisions and, and obviously in consult with, with adults who they trust. But how do you build that trust every year? Can you imagine if you had that core teaching team that really assisted your child all the way through and that they knew that child inside and out? They knew their strengths. You weren't starting fresh over every year. So that's just one of the 
lots of ideas. I, I always tell people I have a million opinions about education and zero authority. Um, <laughs> but I do, I'm, I'm deeply interested um, both in the short and long-term success of our education system because that is the key. It is the key to accessing um, a higher socioeconomic stamp, uh, position and it is the key to success um, now and in the future. It won't, that won't change. Mayor Schof, I've always known you as not one, uh, not a person who's shy about their opinions. Um, going back to our work with the uh, League of Cities and Towns, so what advice would you have for you know state lawmakers, for folks in Congress, uh, about how to make a stronger STEM ecosystem here in Arizona? What would be your advice to them if you could have this platform today? I probably would start by having the uh, Congress and the United States government absolutely stay out of education entirely. I think they have done nothing but uh, warp the system and, and impact it in a ways that have created a lot of the negative results that, that your radical overhaul is aimed to uh, fix. And I, and I actually agree with a lot of the, that concept. I think we really make big, huge errors in the way we, we organize and process the educational system, sorry, it's just not, it's not done right at all, it's all messed up. So I would get the Congress out of it. Uh, the second thing I would do is I would, I would get, I would somehow, you know, if you had a magic wand, I would, I would try to convince our legislature that we need a system that eliminates local funding of schools. I have supported overrides in my community for almost 40 years. We have had overrides pretty much all the time. And it, it, it helps our school district tremendously. And, and we couldn't survive and be as good as we are without overrides. But I think it's a really, really poor way to, ed, to, to fund education in the state because it leads to funding discrepancies school district to school district, which are not fair to the kids. Uh, I think the state needs to come up. And there needs to be a statewide funding. It needs to be fair. And it needs to be adequate to educate these kids and to pay, the, to pay the teachers a reasonable wage. We can't expect to be able to educate our children in STEM subjects if we can't afford to have a teacher who will go and work there to teach them. And we literally are, we, we cut out a huge number of people who would love to go teach and who are very educated in the, in the STEM disciplines and they won't go because they can't raise a family. So the whole system is broken. And I, I mean, I agree, there has to be a major overhaul. We need, to we need to change the way we think about it. And we need to make the funding adequate and fair for all the kids. Now, with that, staying with you for a second, when you say statewide funding, are you talking about a sustainable education funding source? And if so, would, that, would you be OK with uh, taxpayers paying a little more for that? Uh, absolutely. We, we pay more when we have an override. We pay every, locally, the, the districts that have overrides, we pay more. And that puts more money into our school districts. We should have, it's not, it isn't fundamentally fair for my grandkids to be, or we're spending more money per child for my grandkids to be in elementary school or high school than it is for somebody else in another neighborhood that either they don't support overrides because they don't understand how important they are, or they simply can't afford to it. They can't afford to support an override. It's just not fair to those kids. The kids are not doing anything differently. They just, one kid happens to be in, in my district and one kid happens to be in a different district without overrides. So I think the funding needs to be equal across the state. You know, if we're gonna follow the model that we adopted, I don't know, 30 years ago that said that we couldn't fund lo totally locally, so local districts no longer had the ability to, to be totally dependent on themselves and their own property taxes because it wasn't fair, we, we should make it, we should make it equal across the state, and it should all come from the state, and they should all be equal per child. Okay. Mayor, do you want to chime in on that? I know you have some personal experience from being uh, working with tech startups early on sure. in your career. So. Sure, sure. Um, well, there's a lot of great uh, and different unique ideas about education, and I'm not an expert in education, so um, I will say that I don't think it's possible to overinvest in education, especially at the, the early levels. Uh, I'm a product of public schools. Uh, they serve me well. I know there are other educational avenues that can be had. But looking at technology, I think one thing that's changed um, that we all have to recognize, and I think this, this dovetails slightly on one topic with what Mayor Daniels was saying, is that there is a tremendous opportunity with the advent of the internet for students once they reach a certain level 
to self-educate and explore that was a, a much more difficult barrier than it, than it is now. I remember when I was interested in a topic in high school, I'd have to go to the library, pull out the card catalog, <laughs> get out a book that probably smelled because no one had looked at it for 10 years, and start trying to read and search through, and maybe it had a good index, maybe it didn't. My kids will have the privilege, provided they have a good connection and, and a stable place to do it, to do that online. Um, I think the, the one aspect about education that I've been focused on, like I said, I'm not as as uh, I'm not an expert in education and I, I don't get involved in the, as involved as maybe some of the others in the delivery methods, but recognizing the importance of community as well, I think that's a huge piece of education is uh, establishing a community uh, and, and sort of a, a baseline for our citizens. So that can't be um, looked past as well. From the tech standpoint, and from the entrepreneur standpoint, my experience as an entrepreneur and talking to other entrepreneurs is, is a theme that was shared before, is stability and predictability. Um, and that, that also goes to education. I think the more people you get involved and uh, the more predictable uh, a system you have, now it can, you can change it um, to improve it, and it's certainly always good to look for ways to improve. But getting people involved, you look at schools, the schools that tend to have the more active, from my experience, PTAs, or parent groups that are getting involved in the schools tend to perform better because there's more people involved and more people engaged, uh, boosters, whatever, whatever the case is. But um, on, on the sort of entrepreneurial front, on the STEM front, uh, business entrepreneurs have a lot of things to worry about. They're in, a, in, a, in an industry where they're innovating maybe, they're um, trying to do new things, the last thing they want to be worried about is the regulatory environment around them and the law changing or different things disrupting so that they have another set of issues to worry about. So I think that's been a benefit of this state and in a lot of our communities that we sometimes look past. Um, I'm also licensed to practice law in California, so I get legal updates and things change there on a regular basis. The example I use for people, and this isn't directly related to STEM, but on um, landlord-tenant issues. We have a Landlord-Tenant Act. You can pick it up and read it. A tenant can read it, a landlord can read it. In California, and I don't mean to pick on California, but their guide to landlord-tenant issues that doesn't even contain the law, it just tells you where to go find the law, <laughs> is longer than our act. Right. So sometimes there's a benefit in simplicity and predictability because you want business owners to be able to understand the laws and follow the laws and have predictable laws, and that takes one area of concern away from them so they can focus on employment and business. Mayor Dan, just you want to chime in? Sorry, I just wanted to talk about the intersection of tech and education real fast, because there is actually a huge presence in Arizona of ed tech companies that are continuing to grow in this region and in this space and who are offering, I think, a lot of the things that we're looking for in education. So I just wanted to make sure that we were aware of so many of those companies that are already operating here. I was told once several years ago that um, watch closely because Arizona will become the ed tech capital of the country. And I think that's an important component for us to note that while maybe we, they're smaller in scope today, um, as, tech, as education changes, we will see those ed tech companies continue to grow and offer more opportunities to our students. Okay. Let's go over to Mayor Gallego. Let's, we have a few minutes left. So I wanted to have each of you be able to brag or boast about an upcoming STEM-related initiative or anything no. happening in the city of Phoenix that you can talk about. There's, there's press here, so they'll, it, they may make it in the paper, but anything you want to talk about, what's going on or in the future that we can break some news here today. So this, once a journalist, always <laughs> know, a journalist. I can't help it. <laughs> Uh, this December, we expect to open the South Mountain Freeway, uh, 202 Freeway Loop through the city of Phoenix, and we are working hard on a South Mountain technology corridor in that area, really trying to attract, uh, particularly on the, some of the, the manufacturing side, um, also learning from, as Mayor Lord mentioned, what Chandler has done, although in our case, we took the economic development director from Chandler and brought her to Phoenix. <laughs> but we are really excited about that and, and trying to contribute to a problem we've touched on today. Uh, most of the West Side's workforce commutes, and we would love to have that employment in Phoenix for our residents. Awesome, thank you. Mayor Lord, anything you can oh, share just, with us? Yes, you can. I want to make sure I get this, because I sit on the hospital board, and we have just secured a thrombectomy capable stroke 
technology and with specialized doctors and digitally they can go in right to the spread of the is, 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 ischemic, what is the, I'm sorry, I'm giving the wrong pronunciation, ischemic mm. stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, and having had that myself uh, and being shipped from one hospital in the middle of the night to another hospital uh, was somewhat concerning. Um, and so anybody that comes to a Brazo West, you are gonna have uh, really good service on that. And so that's really advanced technology. But you know, you talk, we've talked a lot about a lot of things here today. But really what has happened with society is we have two working people in a family. All right, that's where the stem of it starts. So we want them to go to, to the school and, and talk to the teachers and you want them to do this one. They are just trying to make a living uh, and taking care of their children, um, so and, and sharing the babysitting and sharing their cost. So we don't design our schools and our activities to help people be able to meet some of those requirements. So I think that's where we really need a, a, uh, to focus on is to think about the individual families. Um, and then you haven't talked about the internet and the people that are getting degrees on the internet. And I just found out the software degree graduates, we have more in Arizona than Denver has. And Denver, you would, that surprises you. I think it does because it's sure. a very technical state. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to, to create some new avenues. Um, you can't make uh, one plan for everybody, and that's what our education system, okay? This is what it is, and now you all take it, and you're all going to be successful with it. That's not true and college isn't for everybody. And then college is getting so expensive now, so we have to find alternate methods so people get educated into a workforce where they're happy. They like the job. Do you like being a mayor? I love being a mayor. I love being a mayor. And I would like to see most of my citizens say, I'm going to work today, I love my job. Um, and we don't do that anymore. It's we're becoming very isolated and we don't think about the whole body of a person, the mind and the, and the energy, so. Great, I'll pass Mayor it Hall. On. Um, well, I'd be remiss if we didn't thank you for your military service, so thank you for that. And then, um, any oh, final I, thoughts? It's my honor. Yeah. A um, couple, couple of things. Um, we, have, uh, we have what we call an entrepreneurial boot camp that we put on at our incubator. And we have high schools compete against each other. It's a five-day boot camp. And they have access to attorneys, marketing people, uh, city officials, et cetera, to create a business as a team from each high school. And they compete. And they make a presentation to a panel, and there's an award given. So it's a five-day program. It really gets these kids thinking as a team, taking an idea, execute, you know, putting it in, yeah. putting the thought process to it, putting a business plan together, and presenting it. We have the same program. Yeah, you got the, the same, same program. program. It's, it's mm -hmm. great. It, yeah. it gets these kids really thinking. I wanted to circle back because I think uh, Mayor Daniels and Mayor Schultz both were super bringing up a point about education. And I think... Uh, I, I, I agree. I am surprised that the classroom doesn't have a dashboard for each student. I just, I just don't get that. In other words, because everybody learns at different, different paces to where a teacher can say, okay, student A is behind in reading, doing very well in math. I need to spend more time with, you know, and we have 30 students, where they are in the process of competency. Okay? Yeah, well, and, and so, Mayor Daniels and I are going like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because. Maybe I don't want to know actually. But anyway, I just think, anyway. And then I wanted to come back on a question you asked, which is a really good question about elected officials, Congress. I totally agree with Mayor Schof about, I think the federal government ought to get out of the education business. It's local, it's a local issue. And we need to drive it at the local level. We don't need the, fe the federal government that way. And it's a ton of money spent at the federal level on education, quote, on education. Anyway, the other thing I'd like, to, I'd like to bring up is I would recommend to our state, to uh, the elected officials, and I'm going to bring this up, is that we need to spend more money 
on the Arizona Office of Tourism. Now, why do I say that? Because one, it's got about a 16 to one return on investment, but two, there's a whole image that's created by, by selling Arizona. Then you get CEOs coming here on vacation, go, wow, maybe we could set up business here. I really like this area. <laughs> and get them to thinking about setting up a business. So anyway, yeah. I just think we could do a lot better job at that level of selling Arizona uh, and tourism. So. Well, Mayor Lane, you, you kicked this all off. Do you want to have any final <laughs> departing words of wisdom? A little bit on the line that uh, was, it's just been expressed here, if I could. And, and one is maybe to embrace or endorse some of the things that have been said. And, and I, I, too, would be very uh, supportive of trying to, and this is a major kind of initiative, to get rid of the Department of Education and get the federal government out of this because it's politicized it, it's bucketed money into things that are politically uh, directed and not necessarily to the education of the kids. And, and so that's, that's just a sort of a blanket statement that uh, I would certainly endorse those kinds of concerns and, and where we might be able to go with that. The other is there's an awful lot of answers in exactly the topic we're talking about for STEM education with technology and the innovations within it. One thing that's been a little distressing for me is that one of the problems you have with the implementation and the application of these innovations is you have an established uh, establishment uh, interest that pushes back on some of these things. Even things that may increase our ability to attend to very specific educational needs for our students that may have been internet-based in that. We had a, a company here years ago, and I mean years ago, that had a very extensive program in this. Now, I don't mean, you know, th businesses fail and, and succeed at different bases, but there was a significant amount of pushback uh, to actually having it implemented because of the fear from the establishment base. So I think those are one of the things that we really need to make sure we're overcoming. And everybody understands, I certainly as a, you know, as a businessman all my life, when you invest in something, you're gonna protect it. But we have to be careful if we protect something and some other investment that may have seen its day and is no longer necessarily, but we try to hold on to it. These are, uh, these are, tough words sometimes to be heard by some folks, but that is really one of the big issues when we really talk about getting over the finish line on some of these things and being able to implement it. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you. I know you have super busy schedules, and it's amazing to get all of you here for this discussion for 90 minutes, so maybe we can get a round of applause from the audience. So, thank you. Thank you, Chip, and thank you all. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>